Uh, and Lord, I just thank you for tonight. I thank you that we do have the freedom to meet here in a comfortable building and study your word. And I just thank you for the blessings that you heap upon all of us. And I just thank you that you've preserved the story of David for us, so that all, all that it can teach us about you and about ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> okay, so we're going to be going through the life of David. Um, this is kind of like a part one, because we'll be leaving off right when he becomes king. Um, and I will hopefully do a part two at some point in the near future. Um, but David was the second king of Israel. He lived about 1,000 BC, so he lived about 3,000 years ago. And the first thing we should ask is, why do we study the life of David? Why did God make sure that the history of David was preserved for us? And the most obvious and most important reason, of course, is that David is a very, very vital link in the chain of salvation history. You know, you start with Adam and Eve, they fall from grace, and God tells the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So right away, this is prophetic language, and right away we're being told that God will eventually bring us a Messiah. Jesus will be put to death through the sinful acts of sinful men, but he will triumph over sin through that death and through his resurrection to bring us salvation and to eventually bring an end to sin and death. To get there... God, of, uh, God uses Abraham's descendants to become a nation, the nation of Israel. Um, and David was the greatest king of Israel. He defended it against many enemies, and he made it safe enough so that when his son Solomon was ruling, the, the nation could prosper mightily and, build, and have the peace and stability necessary to build the temple. Um, so God uses David as an important link to Jesus. Um, and he promises David that his heir would rule on the throne forever. That's Jesus. Um, you, you can trace Jesus' human heritage both uh, through, back through Mary and through his adopted dad, Joseph, to David. Um, also, David is one of the Bible's heroes. But we need to define what the Bible considers heroic because David is somewhat less than heroic at, at, uh, a number of times during his life. You know, David was a soldier and a leader, and he was literally brilliant at this. You know, he won fight after fight, uh, often as what was essentially a special forces leader, and he could cleverly improvise a plan in response to dangerous situations. So do we admire David for this? And we should. Things like physical courage, leadership, and the skills of a warrior when used in moral ways that are pleasing to God are admirable qualities that should earn our respect. But that's not why the scriptures present David or any other man or woman of faith uh, in the Bible has heroes. David is a hero because when he did fall, when he sinned, and when he sinned, he really sinned, he afterwards turned to God in repentance. Um, a biblical hero is a person who recognizes that he is broken by sin and that he's responsible to God for the things that he has done wrong. Uh, this is someone who turns to God in sincere uh, repentance, not offering sacrifices or doing penance or somehow making up for the sin, but simply begging God for forgiveness. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Uh, Paul was a religious terrorist. Peter was a braggart and a coward who denied God to save himself. But all these men repented and turned to God because they knew that forgiveness and salvation can only come through God. And God then did incredible things through them. So despite his sins and despite the severity of his sins, David's recognition of his own broken, brokenness and his need for God is what makes him a hero and what makes someone makes him somebody that God can use. Uh, you, you know, David would eventually write in Psalm 51, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart uh, you, God, will not despise. Now also, the story of David, as told in 1 and 2 Samuel, is one of the great works of literature in our civilization. It is, of course, a true story. But it does use literary devices like, like symbolism, allegory, and imagery to tell its story in, 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 a, in an exciting and fascinating way. You re remember that God created everything, and that includes our ability to tell great adventure stories and to pull important meanings out of those stories. And this is done more effectively in First and Second Samuel than is done in any of the ancient works uh, of Western civilization, like the Iliad or the Odyssey or Gwen and the Green Knight, all of which is great stuff and that I actually think for various reasons Christians should read. But none of them match first in the, the, the biblical scriptures in, um, in terms of just being a great story um, in quality and in, in importance. Um, you know, for example, in 2 Samuel 12, the, prince, the prophet Nathan uses a parable about a poor man who loves his pet lamb as an allegory to tell David 
uh, to call David out on his sin. You know, in 1 Samuel 24, David spares the life of Saul, the man who'd been persistently sinning against David. This is both a true story and an allegory of God's willingness to forgive those who persistently sin against him. So God multitasks in the Bible all the time. He's giving us a true history and a great adventure story that works as a work of literature as well. And as a work of literature, the story of David is perhaps most notable in how well it defines the characters in it. Just about everybody we run into in David's life, important people and those who are around for only a few verses, are presented to us that we instantly understand who they are and what makes them tick. David, Saul, Jonathan, Abigail, Joab, uh, Duag the Edomite, he's this weaselly guy that does Saul's dirty work, all are presented to us so vividly that we have no problem realizing that they were living, hu breathing human beings in a story that really happened. Uh, by looking at these people, we can learn that God can use us to do amazing things if we remain faithful to him. But we also can realize just how dark and frightening a turn any of our lives can take when we turn away from God. So where do we start when we examine David's life? We've got to start with Saul, uh, the first king of Israel, who both loved David and regularly tried to kill him. So it was, to say the least, a rather complex relationship. Um, as king, Saul actually did pretty good at first. He saved the city of Jabesh Gilead, and he showed mercy to those who at first refused to recognize him as king. That prevented civil discord and preserved cultural unity. Uh, but Saul never came to the point where he complete tr completely trusted in God, and he often made poor, off-the-cuff decisions. And eventually, he was directly disobedient to God, um, and he was told that his line would end with him. Someone from another family would be king after him. And that moment was a crossroads of, so of sort for Saul. He could have repented and returned to God and accepted the just consequences of his actions with dignity and obedience. Or he could allow his life to descend into one defined by anger, envy, bitterness, and pride. And sadly, Saul took this second road. His refusal to accept God's judgment well, led him down a very, very dark path. Now, one thing it's important to remember is that it's understood that Saul's not an absolute ruler. He's still responsible to God. And when he messes up, Samuel, the nation's spiritual leader, is there to rebuke him. So being a leader or an important person in the eyes of the world does not in any way lessen our responsibility to live a holy life that is pleasing to the Lord. In fact, God places very heavy responsibilities on leaders, holding them to a particularly high standard. And we'll see that standard as we look at David's life. So anyway, Samuel is told by God to um, anoint the next king of Israel. This is at the beginning of chapter 16 in 1 Samuel. Now, this doesn't mean that Saul's being instantly, re instantly replaced. He's still the rightful king until he dies. But it does mean that his oldest son, Jonathan, will not take the throne after him. Somebody else will. So we pick up the story in 1 Samuel 16. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him over the, as king of Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be the king. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he's going to kill me. And the Lord said, well, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. So we see that Samuel, who knew Saul quite well, already realizes how far Saul has fallen. He's in fear that Saul will just out and right murder him if he knows he's anointing the next king. And Samuel is saddened by this, and I have no doubt that he was earnestly praying for Saul to repent. But his personal feelings don't change his duty as Israel's senior prophet. And he needs to get on with anointing Saul's eventual replacement. But he's understandably worried that Saul's going to kill him if he does this openly. So God gives him a plan to visit Jesse. Jesse, by the way, was a grandson of Ruth and Boaz, who lived in Bethlehem, um, to visit Jesse in a way that will hide the reason he's really there. You know, I'm just here to ask you to join in a sacrifice. It's not like I'm looking for the next king or anything. Jeez, that would be silly. That, that's actually a bad way of saying it, though. Um, one commentator wrote that secrecy is not the same as deceit. God is not telling Samuel to lie about his intentions in Bethlehem. He really did go there to offer, to, really did offer a sacrifice there. But the anointing of the new king was a secret affair not to be made public for many years. So anyway, Jesse had eight sons, which makes you feel a little bit sorry for Jesse's poor unnamed wife. 
Um, the seven oldest sons are big and strong, and Samuel thinks any one of them uh, might be a great king based on appearance at all, uh, 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 appearance alone. But God tells him, uh, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Samuel asks if there's anyone else. He asks Jesse, are, are these all the sons you have? Well, uh, these are still, they're still the youngest, Jesse answers. He's tending the sheep. And Samuel says, send for him. Uh, we will not sit down until he arrives. I have to keep looking back at this because I don't trust technology. I want to make sure that, <laughs> okay. Um, from the, so from this, we actually know that David came from a humble family because it's the youngest son doing the menial work, not servants. And so God isn't worried about any of the stuff that people normally worry about. He doesn't care about family connections. He doesn't care about wealth, about formal <laughs> education. All that stuff doesn't matter. God is no respecter of persons. He judges us based on our hearts alone. Uh, and that, that's what makes Christianity the great equalizer. Um, and our, you know, in, in that our economic and social status doesn't matter at all. All we need to do is accept Jesus as our savior and we're in. Um, in Galatians chapter three, Paul wrote, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you were all one in Christ Jesus. So ethnic background, economic status, gender, none of that matters. All that matters is that we're followers of Jesus. So do God doesn't care who the world <laughs> thinks we are. He knows who we really are. And that, that, so the amazing thing is that he loves us anyway. Um, Samuel is told by God uh, that David, who's probably about 15 years old, is, is the guy. So David is anointed as the next king of Israel. Uh, one commentator said about this, David had been brought to the feast. He was so insignificant in his father's eyes that Jesse was sure the prophet wouldn't be interested in, in him. But the Lord was very interested in the shepherd boy. And Samuel, obeying God's voice, anointed David. From that point onward, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David and left Saul. It would be years before David wore Saul's crown, but from this day forward, the kingdom was secure for David. So David's life, before he was king, started as a young shepherd. He would then be a soldier and a commander, and then he, a fugitive from a king who wanted to kill him. It would indeed be years before he wore the crown. But all that time, David was being trained to be king. Um, all the stuff that happens to him teaches him to things like to think quickly on his feet, to have a sense of duty and feel responsibility to those he served, to be an effective and fair leader, and to realize that God is in control even when everything seems to be out of control, and to always trust in God rather than himself. David, God puts David through a lot, but it all has a purpose. And, that, and in that, we run across just another lesson that God's teaching us through David's life. And it's really the thing I want to emphasize the most tonight. God always has a purpose. Few of us are in line to be king, but God does have stuff for us to do. And sometimes we need experience in various aspects of life before we're ready to do that stuff. So God knows this, and he will give us that experience. He will prepare us for the work we have to do. It might not always be pleasant. And we might not always understand exactly why we have to pass through a particular fire, but God has a purpose for us. In Jeremiah 29, God said, for I have plans, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So God always has a purpose. We need to always trust him on that. Now, over the next few chapters, we actually get more information about David, uh, and we start to get a good idea of what sort of guy he is. We know that he's faithful in his duties as a shepherd, and in fact, he's acted with courage in sometimes fighting off lions and bears to protect the flock. We know he was determined in this because he would sometimes rescue a sheep right out of the predator's mouth. So even as a teenager, David was acquainted with the idea of being responsible to others, uh, even if in, in this case, it, the others were sheep rather than people. Um, he, was, he was also learning to act intelligently and quickly in dangerous situations. It was while he was a shepherd that David had an opportunity to get really, really good with a sling, which was his weapon of choice as a shepherd and would soon come in very handy in another situation. So God always has a purpose. What David, the experiences David got as a shepherd were the first step in preparing him to one day be a king. God has a purpose. We'll see that over and over again. Now, not long after David was anointed, a situation arises in which he finds himself in Saul's court. <laughs> 
Now the spirit of the Lord <coughs> had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit of the Lord from the Lord det- uh, tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants to search for someone who can play the liar. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you will feel better. So God had completely rejected Saul. I believe that if Saul had repented, then God would have still been with him. I think his punishment would have still been there. Uh, his, His line would end after him, and David would have been the next king. Because forgiveness of our sins doesn't always spare us from the just consequences of those sins. And God puts a particularly heavy responsibility on leaders to act morally. But had Saul acknowledged his sins and sincerely repented, I think the rest of his reign would have been a successful one, and his personal life a lot happier. But because Saul was locked into bitterness and pride, God allowed an evil spirit to torment him. But God was also using this to help help with David's training program. Because it's David who can play the lyre and apparently has a good singing voice. And he's the one who gets the job singing to Saul. Whenever the, spirit from, whenever the spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul and he would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. So what is David doing here um, in terms of training him to be king? Well, first, he's getting to develop his skill as a musician. That gives him an appreciation for the aesthetic side of life, which God would later use by having David write many of the Psalms. Um, also, David gets to observe the going-ons in Saul's court. He can see for himself how things are done and how leaders interact with followers. And this also brought him into contact with Jonathan, Saul's oldest son, who would become David's best friend. It's yet another invaluable rung on the ladder that leads David to kingship. So God always has a purpose. Um, It's also interesting to note that the scriptures tell us that Saul really liked David and probably came to think of him almost as another son. The two were bonding over David's music, and that just makes Saul behavior, Saul's behavior later on all the more tragic. Now, while this is going on, Israel gets into one of its frequent wars with their arch enemies, the Philistines. Um, this is a map of Saul's kingdom. Uh, the Philistines lived in um, five large cities along the Mediterranean coast, down there on the lower left side of the, can- of the map. Um, and they weren't very good neighbors at all. Um, they always tried to, uh, they were always trying to conquer Israel and bring it, bring, and bring that country under their heel. Um, so the Philistines invade, and Saul brings his army out to fight. And the two armies, the Israelites and the Philistines, end up encamped on opposite sides of a valley. And the biggest, baddest soldier in the Philistine army was Goliath. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was nine feet, nine inches. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor um, of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels, 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung from his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His spear bearer went, uh, his shield bearer went ahead of him. So this guy literally stands taller than the tallest NBA player and he could walk around and fight while wearing what amounted to a couple of hundred pounds of armor and weapons. Um, He was someone you just don't mess with. And nobody wanted to mess with him. The armies don't start a regular battle. Instead, Goliath comes forward every day and challenges anyone from the (laughs) army of Israel for a one-on-one fight. If Goliath wins, the Israelites will surrender and accept slavery. If the Israelites win, the Philistines surrender and become slaves. It's important to note that the commanders of the Philistine army were so confident in Goliath that they allowed this. Um, Goliath is referred to as a champion. He undoubtedly he was a, undoubtedly a veteran soldier who knew how to use his weapons and how to use his size and weight to effect effectively against his opponents. He would have been the, the stere- he, he would not have been the stereotypical high school bully who just picks on the little guys. Though actually, from his perspective, pretty much everyone is a little guy. Um, he, he would have faced skilled warriors in the past and killed them. Uh, so the Philistines were confident that even if, if Israel sent an amazing warrior to fight Goliath, Goliath would still win. No one on the Philistine side of the valley considered Goliath losing even a vague possibility. There is no way the generals in that army would have risked everything on one fight if they hadn't known for sure that Goliath could whoop anybody. Now, sadly, this same attitude is prevalent on the Israel side of the valley as well. 
um, on hearing the Philistines' words, Samuel and all, of, all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So, so Saul and his army were reacting in fear to a, threat, to, to a threat without automatically going to the Lord for help and guidance. As Christians, when we run against a seemingly impossible barrier, our first instinct should be go to, to go to God for help in, you know, in prayer for help. In later years, David himself would write, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you, God, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So God doesn't expect us to do anything without his help. In fact, we can't do anything worthwhile without his help. God and God is always there for us. If he gives us a difficult job to do, he'll give us the guidance, strength, and wisdom to do that job. It's God who leads us. It's God who restores us. It's God who will comfort us. Saul had chosen to forget this. David, so though still a teenager, already knows this. Um, his job singing to Saul wasn't a full-time thing, so he was home with his father at this time. His older brothers are serving in the army. So Jesse tells David to take them some food. Uh, the Israelite army would have had some sort of logistics and supply lines set up, but Jesse would have wanted to give his sons a treat in the form of some good home-cooked food. The Bible doesn't say anything one way or the other, but it's a safe bet that army food was just as bad then as it is now. Yeah. <laughs> so Goliath had been coming forward with his challenge for 40 days when David arrives in the camp. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to a man who kills him. He will give him the daughter in, his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men near him, standing near him, what will, be done for, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised, Philist, uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So David's first reaction wasn't, well, gee whiz, this guy is pretty big and scary. Is it even possible to beat him at all? His first reaction was, hey, guys, we're God's chosen people, and those are guys are idolaters. Why hasn't someone cleaned Goliath's clock by now? What's the problem here? <laughs> and David's older brother, Eliab, gets mad at him. It calls him wicked and conceited for thinking Goliath could be beaten. You know, Eliab isn't going to take any lip from his kid brother, especially when his brother gives an implied criticism of unfaithfulness and cowardice. But David won't back down when he knows uh, he's right. He also kept che keeps checking into the reward. David knows he's been anointed as the next uh, king, and even though he likely wasn't bringing that up in front of Saul, um, he, the, here was a chance to fight for God and maybe get the hand of Saul's daughter in marriage. I think that David's first and foremost, first and foremost at this point in his life was wanting to serve God, and he was probably thinking that maybe marriage to the king's daughter was the first step towards one day fulfilling God's desire in getting David on the throne. But whether that was true or not, it was clear that someone had to step forward in faith and courage to kill Goliath. Now Saul hears what David is saying, and he calls David to him. <clears throat> David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior since his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. So David really gets it, doesn't he? Um, he knows the skills that he has are gifts from God and that it was God's hand in keeping him alive in the past. He knows that God will be with him now when he confronts a nearly 10 foot tall veteran soldier who's probably lost count of the number of people he's killed. He knows that if God is with him, no one can be against him. Now Saul gives David some armor, but it's heavy and awkward and David wasn't used to wearing it, so he does, decides to do without. Besides, David already has a plan to beat Goliath. God has given him just the right background and training to have a tactic he can use to win. 
It's, this is really a microsm to David's career as a warrior. He's a scrapper, and he thinks fast on his feet. So the Goliath is going to be undone by something that the big guy wouldn't have expected at all. David finds some stones uh, that fit nicely into his sling. And the sling would have been made of either leather or plated wool. And it was a weapon used by shepherds to keep wild animals away from the flocks and to keep sheep from straying. Um, and farmers used it to drive birds from <coughs> grain fields, had did, had did, had did those who uh, cared for vineyards. And it was also sometimes a weapon of war, and it could be deadly if used skillfully. David knew how to use it skillfully. With his sling and a staff and the leather pouch for the stones, he marches off to fight Goliath. And meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? <laughs> and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I will give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. So we see here really vividly that Goliath's pride is hurt. He'd been thinking that if the Israelites ever get up the nerve to fight him, they're going to send their best guy. Instead, they're sending this kid who isn't even properly armed or wearing any armor. You know, who did this boy think he was? This is an insult, by golly. Don't they know who he is? He's Goliath. He's killed more men than anybody can count. And this is how they treat him. Well, he'll show them. You know, he'll show them all. He's going to squash this annoying brat, and then they'll either give in or they'll realize that they have to send a real soldier to fight him. And by any earthly standard, Goliath was right. There is no rational reason to think that David can beat him. Yes, he's good with a sling, but he'd have to make a perfect shot under terrifyingly difficult conditions to win. And even then, there's no guarantee that Goliath would go down. From the standpoint of my, mankind, David doesn't stand a chance. But David is confident, not in himself, but in God. What follows are a few of my favorite verses in the Bible. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the, carcass, the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is by, not by a sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he, will give you in, he will, and he will give all of you into our hands. So David's confidence is total, not in himself, but in the God. And then the fight begins as the two run towards each other and then ends almost immediately when David makes his perfect shot. He puts a stone right between Goliath's eyes. And it's really a good thing that this was not a pay-per-view pay account uh, event on cable because <laughs> people would have paid like $39.99 to see a good fight, only to get a one-round knockout after just a few seconds. And it was all very demoralizing uh, to the Philistine army. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine sword and he drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrances of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Uh, those are Philistine cities, so the Philistines are literally run back to their own doorstep. Their dead were strewn along the Sh uh, Shariam road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. So David suddenly jumps from being the youngest son of an unimportant family to being a national hero. Uh, the end of the chapter has, Abner, uh, has Saul asking his general Abner who this young man was. And this actually seems a little bit out of place because in the previous chapter, David had been regularly visiting Saul to, to sing to him. So shouldn't he have already known who David was? Um, there's a couple of possible reasons for that. The simplest and pr perhaps the most likely answer is that Saul was asking what, da what family David was from, checking on David's family status in case he asked David to stay permanently in his court. It's also possible that the author of 1 Ch Samuel changed the chronology for dramatic reasons and that David was re recruited as a musician after he fought Goliath. But the author tells us about the musician stuff first so he doesn't have to break up the flow of the story uh, when things get really exciting. This would, have no, this would no way in effect the historical accuracy of the account. It would just mean that the author was telling the story in the most exciting way possible. You know, remember that 1 Samuel is an example of great literature as well as a history book. And there's a couple other reasonable explanations as well, but we've probably already spent too much time on a, uh, a small detail. <laughs>
So David does stick around to serve Saul on a permanent basis. Because of this, David and Saul's son Jonathan become best friends. And David's, uh, David begins his career as a full-time soldier. And he's really, really good at being a soldier. It isn't long before he's an officer commanding men in battle. And that's where David's troubles really begin. When it, whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns to meet Israel, to, uh, all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. And they, uh, as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands? What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. So pride and jealousy and bitterness, these are passions that rule Saul for the rest of his life. Remember that early on, he showed courage and mercy as a king. His fall, once again, his fall is just a frightening example of how our sinful natures can completely take us over if we turn away from God. And soon after that, Saul takes a walk right into crazy town. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was, was uh, playing the lyre, and as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. So Saul clearly demonstrates here that he can no longer be trusted to make just or moral decisions. But he's still king. Either nobody saw his attempt to impale David, or, or no one present in the court dared call him on it. Now, what's unspoken here, but is clearly significant, is that David, despite the outright attempt to murder him, continues to serve his king loyally. David knew he was selected to be king after Saul, but he also knew that he couldn't take the throne away from Saul by force. Civil war, especially in a time of constant war against the Philistines, would have devastated Israel. And Saul was God's chosen king, and God, David left ultimate justice in God's hands while he continued to exhibit loyalty to his king and his country. Uh, back to 1 Samuel, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him, and he gave him command over a, thousand of a, over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul, Saul saw, how, saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. So Saul was literally hoping that David would get killed in battle. This is confirmed a few verses later. But David kept winning. David was gaining invaluable experience as a soldier and a leader, and with God's help, he was soon very successful in this. Saul grew more and more afraid of losing his throne to David, while the general population grew more and more enamored of David as a hero. Now Saul sinks to what I think is a new low, even for him, when he starts using his own daughter, specifically his oldest daughter Mirab, as a pawn in his game of Let's Kill David. He offers her to David as a wife, if David agrees to keep fighting the Philistines. You know, sooner or later, a Philistine soldier has got to get in a lucky shot. <laughs> but David demurs. says the youngest son of an, unimportant pam of an unimportant family, he doesn't consider himself worthy of being the king's son-in-law. And he doesn't have the appropriate dowry anyway. So Mirab is married off to someone else. Then Michael, David's other daughter, falls in love with David. Saul's other daughter, rather, uh, falls in love with David. It's interesting that the Bible stresses that she feels actual romantic love for him in a culture where arranged marriages were common. Once again, the scriptures give us a quick but effective portrait of one of the key, key characters in this story. That Michael really cares for David highlights the, the intensity of her emotions when she later has to choose between helping her dad catch David or helping David escape. Now Sir Saul learns how Michael, Michael feels, and he couldn't be happier. Not because his daughter is in love, but because this gives him yet another chance to get David killed. He arranges for some of his advisors to tell David about Michael's feelings and further says that, David, that Saul really likes David and would love to have him as a son-in-law. Now, David knows this is the guy who once tried to pin him to a wall with a javelin. So he's got to be suspicious. But he still remains loyal to his king. And he's saying or doing nothing to dishonor him. 
David again points out that he can't pay a dowry worthy of a princess. But that's okay, says Saul. I'll waive the dowry. Just bring me the foreskin of a hundred Philistines. Now, there's two important things to know about this offer. First, yuck. <laughs> Second, this is obviously a trap. David has to kill a hundred enemy soldiers. If that doesn't get him killed, nothing will. But having God on your side always gives you something of an advantage. David takes his men into the field and kills 200 Philistines. The less said about collecting the trophies afterwards, the better, because once again, yuck. Um, then Saul gave him his daughter Michael in marriage. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him, and he remained his enemy for the rest of his days. The Philistine commanders to continued to go out in battle, and as often as they did, David met them met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. So David, at this point, seems to have it, have, it, have it made. He's married to the king's daughter. He's a national hero loved by the people. He's a skilled leader and warrior. So is he ready to be king? Not quite. God still has a few more very difficult hoops he needs David to jump through before that happens. In chapter 19, we see that Saul just gives up on expecting the Philistines to kill David for him. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and, I will, t uh, and will tell you what I find out. Now, Jonathan's decision to warn David, which he does several times, is a really big deal. And it's a much bigger deal in our, than our culture recognizes today. Uh, this was a patriarchal society. The oldest man in the family was the authority figure over everyone else. And so aside from the responsibility to obey his king, Jonathan had a responsibility to obey his father uh, that he would have felt on a much deeper level. And God does expect us to honor our parents and to obey authority. Exodus 20 tells us, honor your father and your mother so that you may, may live long in the land of the Lord your God, the Lord your God is giving you. Um, and Romans 13, all of you must obey those who rule over you. There is no authorities except the, one, the ones God has chosen. Uh, those who, who now rule have been chosen by God. But Jonathan, though, will eventually work against his father in defiance of authority, and the scriptures are clearly presenting him as right to do so. So why, what God is showing us, that our obedience to authority is not blind. We must look to God for the wisdom um, and um, uh, for, we want to look, must look to God for wisdom, and we must be thoroughly aware, aware of biblical standards of right and wrong to recognize a situation when we're justified in disobeying authority. As a general rule, when someone in authority would obligate us to participate directly in sinful activity, that's when we have to say no. So Jonathan does try to reason with his dad, pointing out that David has done him no wrong. Uh, the life he uh, the life he took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine, meaning Goliath. The Lord won a great victory for all of Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why do you do wrong to an innocent man like David for killing him for no reason? By the way, notice that Jonathan, like David, gives credit to the defeat of, of Goliath to God. It's another quick insight into to the heart of one of the characters here. Jonathan is David's best friend and sticks by him, and he's also a godly man who recognizes that we can accomplish nothing without God. So anyway, he talks Saul out of committing murder. We'll see several other times where Saul has an attack of conscience and backs off from his sinful behavior. But sadly, that never lasts. He, he never lets go of his bitterness and his envy, and his intent to kill David always resurfaces. A war breaks out with the Philistines, and David once, is once again victorious in battle. Once again, he's the hero of the people, not Saul. From Saul's warped perspective, this is just intolerable. So soon after, David is back home playing his lyre for Saul. By the way, this is in the city of Gibeah, which is located in the tribe of Benjamin. Jerusalem, which is south of, Benjamin, of, south of Gibeah, was not yet the capital. Uh, so David's playing for Saul, and once again, Saul grabs a spear and tries to kill him. From this point on, David is a fugitive. He runs for it, and he knows there's no going back now. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. 
So Michael let David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. Then Michael took an idol and laid it in the bed, covered it with a garment, and put on some goat's hair on the head. When, Saul's men, when Saul sent the men to capture David, Michael said, he's ill. I actually feel a little bad for these soldiers that Saul sent to arrest David. Saul was expecting them to bring David back to him. But now they're standing at the door to David's house with Saul's own daughter standing in their way. Do they just muscle their way past them? If they mess with Saul's daughter, won't that get them, get them in bad with their boss? You know, David appears to be lying right there in bed. But what would Saul say if they push around his daughter to get to David? It's a very awkward situation, and I can really picture them fidgeting and looking nervously about and whispering to one another about what they should do next. In the end, they go back to Saul, who just snaps at them to enter the house and bring David back. So it's back, back to David's house, uh, probably trying to be as diplomatic as possible while forcing their way in and going to the bed. And then they find the idol topped with goat hair under the covers rather than, rather than David. And you can't help but feel for these guys at that moment. Now they've got to go back and tell their king that David's gotten away and gained a head start. Um, David later wrote about this in Psalm 59. Uh, and it gives us insight into his growing spiritual maturity. You know, here's the first four verses of that psalm. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Be my fortress against those who are attacking me. Deliver me from evil doers. And save, uh, save me from those who are after my blood. See how I lie and wait for me. Fierce men conspire against me. For no offense or sin of mine, Lord. I have done no wrong, yet they, they, they are ready to attack me. Arise to help me. Look, look to, on my plight. So David is going to eventually realize that it's his own cleverness and quick that his own cleverness and quickness does not allow him to get away he is clever and quick but he knows that these are gifts from god and it's only with god's help can those gifts be used to his full potential he continues to trust in god rather than himself um, and he asks god to punish those who sin against him and i think that uh, this is an interest in seeing justice done rather than a desire for personal revenge David will eventually have a couple of chances to kill Saul, but he'll refuse to do so, in part because David is not yet king, and he doesn't have the right to dole out justice in that situation. Instead, he trusted in God to ultimately bring justice. Now back to the story. So, uh, David had gone to see Saul in the city of Ramah, which was a territory um, in the territory of the tribe of Benjamin north of Gibeah, the capital. And Samuel takes David to uh, Naioth, which is probably a building or a district in Ramah that houses the prophetic school that Samuel led. And what happens next is absolutely wonderful. And it shows us that God is still watching over David. Word came to Saul, David is in Naioth uh, at Ramah. When I get to heaven, I have a long list of names in the Bible to complain about. <laughs> I, I got a list, that's the first thing I'm doing. Um, and so he, so, he, so he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying, with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came on Saul's men, and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it, and he sent more men, and they prophesied too. And Saul sent men a third time, and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great cistern at Siku. And he asked, where are Samuel and David? Over, over in Naioth at Ramah, they, they said. So prophesizing in this context probably means they were calling out words of prayer and praise to God and quite possibly rebuking each other as well. All of this because the Spirit of God was so strong that they literally couldn't help themselves. The ESV Study Bible says their aggressive intent was humbled before the Lord's um, anointed king. So Saul went to Naioth at Ramah, but the, but the Spirit of God Came even, um, came even on him, and he walked along prophesying until he came to Naioth. He stripped off his, his garments, and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay naked all that day and all that night. This is why people say, is Saul also among the prophets? So the Spirit of God was so strong that Saul is also stripped of his free will and finds himself calling out prayers and praise to God. Naked, by the way, probably means he'd thrown away his outer garment uh, and was still wearing at least a tunic and belt which does make for a much less icky mental image. Um, all of this, David, all this gives David time to make a break for it and get away from Rama. He doubles back to Gibeah, and he goes to Jonathan, and he says, why is your dad trying to kill me? Now, Jonathan, who had just recently thought he talked Saul out of any intent to kill David, at first thinks David is wrong. But David is persistent, and Jonathan begins to worry that his father might once again be thinking of committing murder. 
This must have been a, a difficult and emotional moment for Jonathan. And it's perhaps the moment he realized that he might, he might actually have to actively work against his king and his father. So Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. So David said, look, tomorrow's the new moon feast, and I'm supposed to dine with the king. So let me go and hide in the field until evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father misses me, tell him David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because of an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure he is determined to harm me. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought, me, brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I'm guilty, then kill me yourself. Why, why hand me over to your father? So Jonathan agrees to this plan. I still think he's not completely willing to accept that Saul once again wants to kill David, but he'll use David's ruse to find out for sure one way or the other. And he then says to David, but show me uh, unfailing kindness over the Lord's kindness as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. Uh, and do not cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut, uh, cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So, so Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, may the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. So, Jonathan here uh, felt a very deep friendship for David, but he wasn't simply allowing his friendship with David to trump his loyalty to Saul. Though facing up to the idea that Saul might want to commit murder is painful for him, in the end, Jonathan decides what to do what is right in the eyes of God. If his father wants to commit murder, then Jonathan will work to prevent that murder. So Jonathan comes up with a plan to signal David after the new moon feast by firing arrows near the place where David would be hiding, and Jonathan would send a servant to look for the arrows afterwards, and what Jonathan said to the servant would tell David whether or not he was safe from Saul. So they come up with just a brief code message for each other. The feast begins. David isn't there on the first day, and Saul thinks maybe he'd become ceremonially, ceremonially unclean and couldn't come right away. But David still isn't there on the second day of the feast. Then Saul said to his son Jonathan, why hasn't the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? And Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked me for, for permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go, because our family is observing a sacrifice in that town, and my brother has ordered me to be there. If I have found favor in your eyes, let me go get away to see my brothers. That is why he has not come to the table. Well, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. This is very possibly the worst moment of Jonathan's life. There's no question now that his father has slid completely into sin, that bitterness and envy have completely consumed him. Desperately, Jonathan makes one last attempt to speak up for David. In an all-consuming anger, Saul thrills, throws a spear at his own son. And Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. On that second day of the feast, he did not eat because he was grieved at his father's heart shameful treatment of David. The next morning, Jonathan goes out into the field where David's been hiding, and using the code words they worked out earlier, he signals him that Saul does indeed want to kill him. Jonathan sends the servant back to town so that he and David can meet without anyone seeing them. Uh, and Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn, uh, for we have sworn friendship with each other uh, in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to town. Now it would be several years before these two friends would get to meet again. And as far as we know, they would meet only one more time before Jonathan's death. So David begins a journey as a fugitive that will zigzag him uh, back and forth across Israel and the surrounding lands for the next few years. This is perhaps as much as 10 years. He was 30 when he became king, and he did get an early start as soldier. So he still might have been as young as 20 at this point. Uh, he might have been a few years older, but not much. He starts life as an exile by heading south to a city of Nob, where the high priest uh, Ahimelech is currently stationed. He apparently brings a few of his men with him, 
You know, these are probably, probably these companions were hiding nearby when David went to speak to the high priest. And we don't know how many, but these are undoubtedly soldiers who had been serving with him in the wars against the Philistines. These are guys who trusted David's moral character and his leadership. The king wanted to kill David, but these guys knew that David wouldn't have done anything wrong, and they stuck by him to the point of becoming fugitives along with him. It's something that is, uh, is simply implied in the background of the story, but it's there. David's character had inspired an intense loyalty in his men. Now, Ahimelech is actually nervous when he sees David, apparently alone. He would have been aware on some level of trouble between David and the king. So when David, who would normally have traveled with his mil military unit, comes along, um, Ahimelech it, is, I think, understandably put out by this. Whatever's going on, it looks like he might get caught in the middle of it. Now, to his credit, he will end up a a choosing to act with mercy. Now, David out and out lies to the priest, telling him he's on a secret mission for the king. Now, he's doing this to save his own, life and the, the li his own life and the lives of his men. And as a soldier, David unused, undoubtedly used deception in fighting the Philistines on any number of occasions. I can imagine him or one of his soldiers who could fake a Philistine ac accent coming up on a sentry and luring him away somewhere so the rest of the men could get in to attack the enemy camp. Uh, and this would have been a legitimate act of warfare, and I've got no problem with that. But here, David is lying to a faithful priest of God. Now, because of the difficult circumstances, it's tempting to be understanding and give David credit for, again, being clever. But sin is sin, and I think he was wrong, that he should have taken a chance and told Ahimelech the truth. Not all commentators agree about this, right? You know, if you read about different commentators, some think, ooh, look at this cool David thing David did, and others say, wow, David sinned here. Um, so there is disagreement amongst theologians about this, and I'm going to get back to that point in a moment. So David is given consecrated bread that's normally reserved for priests. And when Jesus refers to this incident in Matthew 12, that's what he stresses as the main lesson. The Israelites were expected to obey the ceremonial laws that God gave him, but those laws never trump the need to show mercy uh, to someone in need. If somebody's starving, you give them whatever food is handy, even if it's food normally promised to the priests. Just like you would cook a starving man a meal, even on the Sabbath when you aren't supposed to eat. Mercy always trumps legalism, which is fortunate for us because it's God's mercy alone that allows our sins to be forgiven when the law would uh, require our condemnation. In addition to the food, Samuel asks for weapons, and he ends up taking Goliath's sword. But all of this is seen by a slimy little guy named Duag the Edomite. And how do we know he's slimy? We'll get to that in the next chapter. I, I say little just because that's how I picture him in my mind. There's actually a specific actor I think he looked just like. So um, David now has a weapon and food. His next step is to get out of Dodge as quickly as possible. And he definitely makes an unwise decision here. He decides the safest place to hide would be among Saul's worst enemies, the Philistines. And he heads west to the Philistine city of Gath. That day, David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David's his tens of thousands? Um, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So David walks into the lion's den. We have incident after incident that shows us David was smart and quick thinking, but he, so he really should have seen this coming. He approaches Achish and he says, hi, can I live with you? And Achish understandably replies, aren't you the guy who killed thousands of my people? I don't think I like you. <laughs> this and David's lie to the high priest demonstrate, I think, why God is putting David through all this before he can give him the throne. As smart and capable as David is, even at a still young age, we can see that he sometimes does react to a situation without considering all the practical or moral implications. We know that, he's, uh, that he is often is a godly man who seeks the Lord's wisdom a lot of the time, but he's not quite at the point where looking to God for guidance is his natural first response every time. He still needs some work before he could become king. And it's interesting to remember that as a teenager, when he fought Goliath, David had shown complete trust in God. Now as an adult who had, been in, had had incredible success as a soldier, he seems to, to, to need to relearn this lesson. He hasn't rejected God, but his continual victories off the last few years uh, lead him to at least sometimes forget that it was God and not his own cleverness that has given him glory. <laughs>
um, that he needs to that he he needs to relearn that he has to depend on God rather than himself. And and really, how long how often does earthly success turn us away from thinking about God? Even so, David is indeed a quick thinking guy, and he pro he had probably left his men hidden nearby while he approached Achish, so he knew something might go wrong. And when it uh, becomes apparent that Ekesh is probably going to kill him, he quickly improvises a wonderful Mission Impossible level plan. He pretend so. Yep, yeah, we're so he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the door and letting saliva run down his beard. And Akish said to his servants, "Look at this man. He's he's insane." Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? So David pretends that he's just gone nuts. And many ancient cultures have, have rules about never hurting the insane. It's usually for superstitious reasons rather than out of compassion. But David uses that attitude to save himself. He no longer, he no longer seems a threat, and he soon manages to just be so annoying that Achish simply has him thrown out of the palace. So this does consist of David practicing yet another um, uh, deception, you know, essentially telling another lie. And various commentators once again alternately praise or condemn David for the lies he's told, uh, that he's told over the last few chapters. So the scriptures themselves don't seem to always give us absolute moral guidance to judge whether David is doing right in God's eyes when he deceives Achish or when he deceives the high priest. I think the author of 1 Samuel did this on purpose. The situations are morally confusing because David is not seeking God's wisdom through prayer before taking actions. David is reacting to the situations he's in without looking to God first. So he acts in a way that might seem right to man, but isn't necessarily right in God's eyes. If we don't look to God for moral guidance, then our own perceptions of what is right and what is wrong will become confused. We see that in our own culture in many different ways. The lies David had been telling are the subject of debate by biblical scholars over their morality because the story itself reflects the moral confusion that can seep into our lives if we don't put God first. So when David gets into trouble in Gath, he's being reminded to trust in God in all circumstances or your life will go haywire. After getting away from Gath, he wrote Psalm 34, uh, which shows he's learning from his mistakes. Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, do his holy people. For, the, for, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you fear of the Lord. So David had trusted in God rather than himself when he fought Goliath. He was learning that no matter how capable he became as a leader and a warrior, he needed to continue to trust in God in all situations rather than in trust in himself. This was the attitude he, he needed to eventually become a just and wise king. Now, uh, we're up to chapter 22 now. David heads east, uh, leaving Philistine territory. He hides out in a cave in Adullam, which is in the territory of Judah. And he's joined there by his parents and his brothers, as well as a number of other people. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. Now, there's actually a lot of information implied in these verses. David already had a few guys with him, certainly men who had served under him in the army and felt an intense loyalty to him. Now he began to attract a band of outcasts and misfits. There was undoubtedly, this undoubtedly included a few, good men, a few men of good character who had simply fallen on hard times, but it also would have included those who were irresponsible or prone to get into trouble. Part of the reason all this that's, uh, was happening, remember, is to train David to be an even more effective leader than he already was. He'd done well with disciplined soldiers. Now, how would, uh, how would he do with this ragtag band of misfits that was coming to him? We don't get any details at all about how David trained and inspired and disciplined his men, but I kind of picture him going into hardcore marine drill instructor mode <laughs> to get these guys into shape. They, they needed to learn to obey orders and work effectively together. And as we will see, David whipped these guys into shape. They essentially became a highly skilled special forces unit that was quite capable of winning pretty much any fight they got into. Of all the things David had to accomplish during his how-to-be-king leadership training, turning this gang of distressed, debt-ridden, discontented bums into a disciplined fighting force may well have been his most uh, notable accomplishment. 
Now, one problem David had at this point was looking after his family. His brothers could serve as soldiers with him, but his parents would have been getting on in years. And making sure they stayed safe while, while a part of a band of fugitives that would have to move around a lot, this was a real problem. So he travels west to Moab, over here on the other side of Israel. Um, and he arranged for his parents to say, stay there in safety. And I, I really love David for this. Even in the midst of trouble, he honored God by honoring his parents. Remember, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, while all this is going on, Saul is tragically demonstrating that his jealousy and his pride continues to sink him farther and farther down into pure evil. Mm -hmm. First, he gathers soldiers just from his home tribe of Benjamin. This is an attempt to use tribal jealousy to make sure they stayed loyal to him. Mm -hmm. And then he gives him the worst inspirational speech ever. Listen, men of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make all of you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Is that why you have all conspired against me? No one will tell me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is concerned about me or tells me that my son has incited my servant to lie and wait for me, as he does today. This, this is really tragic. This is like pathetic. Remember that Saul had started out as a pretty good king. Now he's trying to murder David, and he comes across as paranoid and self-obsessed, even when he's trying to inspire his men. Now, Duag the Edomite is with Saul at this point as well. Remember that he was at Nob when David had talked with Ahimelech, the high priest, to get food and weapons. He apparently hadn't said anything about that before, but now he speaks up and tells Saul what happened. Here we get a perfect encapsulation of Dueg's character. He's an opportunist who's looking for just the right moment to get himself in good graces with the king. Earlier I called him slimy, and he is. He's a man without personal ethics uh, who takes action only when, he, when it can when, only when he can benefit himself. I don't think he personally cared whether David got away or not. But now he saw that helping Saul catch David might earn him brownie points and he might get rewarded or a powerful position in Saul's court. So that's when he speaks up. Armed with this knowledge, Saul takes his men to Nob and co confronts uh, Ahimelech, the high priest. Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and acquiring of God for him so that he has rebelled against me and he lies in wait for me as he does today? Ahimelech answered the king, uh, who of all your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard, and highly respected in your household? Was that day the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. Let the king not accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing about the whole affair. So Ahimelech is actually being uh, quite reasonable. Saul, David was one of Saul's best soldier and his son-in-law, so why would the priest do anything other than help him? Ahimelech didn't know anything about the troubles between them. I think it's also possible that in reminding Saul of David's past loyalty to the king, he was making an attempt to mediate the conflict. But Saul simply gets angry, and he takes another step farther down into pure evil. He orders Ahimelech and all the priests killed. His men balk at this. None of the soldiers want to raise their hand against God's servant. But Duag, well, here's another chance to get good and good with Saul. The king ordered Duag, you turn and strike down the priests. So Duag the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He um, also put to, to the sword Nob, the, the town of priests, with its men and women, its children and infants, its cattle, donkey, and sheep. So Saul is having this guy slaughter his own people because he's just so paranoid about uh, David. So how far can we fall if we turn away from God? Uh, and I know I've said it, said it several times, but it's important. Saul life, Saul's life gives us a rather frightening answer to that question. Now, one of Ahimelech's sons named Abathar, Abiathar, I am going to complain about the names, I am, <laughs> escapes and joins David. And this is a very important thing. The, to quote the ESV study Bible, the, thus the true priesthood and priestly council moved from Saul to David. Ab Abiathar would remain with David as his priest until David's death, helping him against Absalom. So David now has a band of men, he's trained to be a crack fighting unit, and he even has a priest to provide spiritual guidance. And we see that David is maturing as a leader. When earlier he was leaping before he looked and getting into trouble, he now goes to God in, uh, in prayer when his next major decision is upon him. Because the Philistines attacked the city of, of Kililah, which is in the tribe of Judah. Despite his trouble with Saul, David wants to defend his country. 
but before marching into battle, he inquires of God and gets confirmation that he should go. So David is learning, depend on God, not himself. His men aren't so sure. But David's men said to him, here in Judah we are afraid. How much more if we go to, to Kiliot against the Philistine forces? Once again, David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered him, go down to Kiliot, for I am going to give the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Kiliah, fought the Philistines, and carried off the livestock. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Kiliah. So David turns to God again for further confirmation in order to reassure his men. Then they march to Kiliah and they kick Philistine butt. Remember that a short time before, David's men had been a disparate gang of misfits. Now they're taking on trained, well-armed enemy troops and they're winning. Now, sadly, the people of Kililah don't come out looking very good. When Saul learns that David is there, he sends troops to catch him. David inquires of God again, as he should, and he learns that the people of the city are, will turn him over to Saul. So he and his men, now about 600 guys, leave and start moving from one location to another so that Saul can't get a lock on them. And it's during this time that David and his best friend Jonathan meet one more time. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horesh. So D Jonathan knew that David had been anointed by God to be the next king. And here he shows remarkable faith, and considering that he would have been the next king, he shows remarkable humility. David is a fugitive on the run, but Jonathan has no doubt that one day he will be king. He doesn't doubt that God's purpose will be fulfilled. And even though this means that Jonathan won't get to the throne, he accepts this without anger, jealousy, or spite. He's simply happy to see God's will done. It could not have been easy for a godly man like Jonathan to oppose his father, um, like to oppose his father like this on any level. But Jonathan was determined to do what is right. Uh, he wanted to serve David as an advisor, and that he didn't live to do so is a tragedy of epic proportions. If he'd been around in later years, I can vividly picture him confronting David when David invite, invited Bathsheba over, just dope slapping him one and telling him to leave the married woman alone. And Jonathan is the one guy that David would have listened to. Mm -hmm. So this, some local people again tell Saul about David. Saul almost catches him, but at that moment the Philistines attack and Saul has to turn aside from pursuing David to, to uh, deal with this. Mm -hmm. So we clearly see God's hand in the timing all of this, a uh, timing of all of this. Now David returns to the chase when he can, or Saul returns to the chase when he can, and he soon closes in. This leads to one of the most powerful stories in the Bible. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goat. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and David went in to or Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. And the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of to you. I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and he cut a corner of, Saul, uh, off of Saul's robe. So this is really a dramatic situation. Mm -hmm. Saul enters a cave because he thinks it's empty because he has to go potty. And he has no idea that the man he's looking for and trying to kill is hiding a little farther back in that same cave. David and a few of his men were there. You know, probably hoping the wind didn't blow toward them while Saul did his business. And David's men are essentially saying, ooh, kill him now, kill him now, kill him now. God is giving you an opportunity here. Use it. Well, God is indeed giving David an opportunity here. It's a chance to test his moral character. He can kill David, and he might be able to grab the throne after that. But God told David he would be king after Saul, not that he should take the throne away from Saul. Saul, despite how badly he was stumbling, was still the God's chosen king. If David kills him, it would be murder. And from a practical point of view, if David gets to the throne through assassination, then the legitimacy of his rule would always be open to question. There's no way he would ever really have the respect and the loyalty of the people. So maybe David was briefly tempted when he sneaked up on Saul. But in the end, all he did was cut away a piece of his robe. And, he, and even at that, he was guilt-stricken. 
he rebukes his men and he marches out of the cave and prostrates himself before Saul. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have, been with, you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urge me to kill you, but I spared you. I said I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but I didn't kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. David then calls on God to judge between them and punish whichever of them is in the wrong. It's a really stirring speech. And for all too brief a moment, Saul feels convicted. When David finished saying this, Saul said, is that your voice, David, my son? He wept aloud. You're more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you have treated me today. So Saul, at that point, actually acknowledges that David will be the next king. Then he takes his men and he heads home. But among the lessons that God is teaching David is to be a good judge of character. David knows Saul well enough not to trust him. Sooner or later, that pride and bitterness will reassert itself. His, uh, Saul's repentance is just a momentary thing based on emotion. It's not something that reaches his heart. Um, so, and that momentary repentance means that he will probably will, means that probably not for real, and he will be coming after David again. He will never truly accept that the, his line won't continue on as the future kings of Israel. So David and his men stay together and out of Saul's way in the wilderness. Now during that time, several important things happen in David's life. The first event happens soon after the prophet Samuel dies. David changes location at that time, knowing that without Samuel's influence, Saul is all the more likely to, to, to degenerate back into pride and jealousy again. And because of this move, David needs supplies for his men. So he reaches out to a local rich guy for help. A certain man in Maon, who, whose property, uh, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep, for which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surely, surly and mean in his dealings. Now, most marriages in that day were arranged, which explains how two completely different people ended up with each other. Um, different on a moral level, I should say. Many strong marriages involve a man and a woman with very different personalities, but few marriages are happy when the husband and wife have completely opposing moral viewpoints. Um, David sent 10 men to Nabal to ask for supplies with a message that reminds Nabal that David's men have never mistreated any of Nabal's servants or taken any of his property. And this is actually key information about David's growing skills as a leader. He kept his men in line. No looting, no stealing, no hurting the innocent. Later in the chapter, one of Nabal's servants says that David's men had actually worked to protect them. But Nabal reacts to the request out of pure meanness. He turned, turning the men away in an insulting manner. One of the servants who hears this is insightful enough to see trouble coming, so he goes to Abigail and tells her what happened. Now, when David hears Nabal's answer, he loses his temper. David said to his men, each of you strap on your sword, and, and they did, and David strapped on his, his as well. About 400 men went with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. So by golly, if Nabal's going to be such a jerk, then David will just march in with swords drawn and take what he wants. And David would teach him to watch his mouth in the future. You know, David had grown a lot as a leader, but we see here that God still needs to teach him at least one more lesson about thinking before acting, especially thinking about the moral implications. And God has just the person handy who can teach him that lesson. Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five seahs of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, go ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal. So along with her supply train, she meets David while he's approaching to attack Nabal. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face on the ground. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. As for me, your servant, I did not see the men my, uh, the men my Lord sent. 
And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your, with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let this gift, which your servant has brought to my Lord, be given to the men who, who follow you. And that's just the beginning of her speech. She continues to express herself with calmness, with self-control, and with wisdom. She, by the time she's done, God has used her to change David's heart in this matter completely. You know, and when an unmarried man leaves, reads this passage, if he has any good sense at all, he'll find it hard not to fall in love with Abigail. And it's no surprise that David was taken with her. David said to Abigail, Praise be the Lord, the God, the God of Israel, who sent you to meet me today. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, left, lives, who, um, who kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive at daybreak. So the Bible tells us that a gentle answer turns away wrath, and Abigail provides us with an excellent example of just how true that is. David marches away. The next day, when Nabal finds out how much of his stuff had been given away, he actually has a heart attack, and he soon dies. And David does one of the smartest things he ever did. He marries Abigail. Now, his wife, Michael, had been taken away from him and given to another man by Saul. So, so David could arguably be thought of himself as free to marry again. He had a Proverbs 31 life. He had an intelligent, capable woman who can love, support, and encourage him. All he had to do, all he had to do to, to get rid of like 95% of his future problems was to realize that God had always intended marriage to be between one man and one woman. He can honor Abigail and he can stay faithful to her and he can tell her that she is sufficient for him and that he, and, and he would be doing exactly the right thing to assure that many of his later troubles would never come. David also married Ahinamon of Jezreel, and they were both his wives. David, you complete, unmitigated, moronic, single-minded, stupid, unthinking, mush-brained idiot. <laughs> why, why, why did God allow polygamy when it was clear right from Adam and Eve that marriage was meant to be between one man and one woman? I think that, at least in part, God wanted to give us so many vivid examples of how emotionally and spiritually destructive polygamy is. There's, not, there's never an example of polygamy in the Bible that doesn't lead to bro damaged emotions, broken relationships, and unhappy families. It happens every time. It never ends well. And nearly all of David's future troubles and failures were a result of his taking multiple lives and the horrible effects that had on him as a father and a, hu and a husband and a father. He had it made with Abigail. There's no reason for any man to be married to a woman like Abigail and not be thanking God for the gift every day. So that's kind of like a lesson in David's life that goes out to husbands. Never let a day, without, never let a day go by without telling your wife that you love and appreciate her. Never be unfaithful, not with, even with your thoughts or where you look. Never do or say anything that implies she alone is not sufficient for you. And when God gives you your Abigail, get down on your knees every day to thank him for that and be satisfied, and if you don't do that, you're also an idiot. <laughs> um, I'm now afraid to look up because I'm afraid I'll accidentally look at a married man here and think that I'm, I'm like saying that directly to him, so I'm just going to look up. Nobody take it personally. You looked at me first. Well, <laughs> okay. well despite this, uh, David's, David's overall direction of his life is w what made him... Uh, a man that God could use. And he does show increasing wisdom in other areas. So soon after his marriages, marriages, ugh, we get evidence that David was wise uh, when he stayed in the wilderness after Saul's superficial repentance. Saul again gathers some troops and he comes after him. And this time he brings along his top general, Abner. And David takes one of his men and they sneaks into Saul's camp, slip, slipping past the guards and coming up on Saul while he's sleeping. Yep. Uh, Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him, or, it, or his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that is near his head, and let's go. 
So it's really a replay of the last time this happened. But at least Saul isn't going poopy this time, so it's not quite as unpleasant. David, d d despite what many people might consider adequate justification, does, will not kill God's anointed king. When he gets to the throne, it will be according to God's timing and God's plan. The next morning, he calls down from the top of a hill and rebukes Abner for doing such a poor job of protecting the king. When Saul hears David's voice, he realizes that David has once again spared his life. And then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son. Because you consider my life precious today, I will not harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have been terribly wrong. David's heard that before, hasn't he? Um, and Saul doesn't have long to live at this point, and it would be nice to think his, that this time his repentance is real, but his future action shows that he never does turn back to God. And David still knows enough not to trust Saul. He once again takes his men and moves into Philistine territory. But this time, the situation was different than it was when he went to the king of Gath a few years before, and he had to pretend to be insane to get out alive. At that earlier time, it had been real early in his estrangement with Saul. But now the rift between them would have been bigger news, and the Philistines would have been willing to take a chance on David to gain access to his skilled fighting force. Now, I'm going to jump through chapters 27 and 28 pretty fast. Part of that, those chapters involve Saul con con uh, consulting a witch, which for our purposes here tonight, I'm just going to say, continues to highlight his spiritual and moral downfall. David and his men fought for the Philistines for about a year or so. But when David claimed he was attacking towns in Israel, he was really going elsewhere and attacking other enemies of Israel. Then he'd bring the loot back to the Philistines and convince them that he was now an enemy of Israel. This guaranteed his safety, the safety of himself, his men, and their families during this time. And this purpose of David's life, sir, this period of David's life serves two purposes. First, uh, it gave him still more experience as a leader and a warrior. Second, it kept him out of Israel during the Philistine invasion that would result in Saul's death, so that he was safe and in a position to return and claim the throne afterwards. There's at least one commentator that thinks David made one more mistake as a fugitive by, by leaving Israel to live in an idolatrous culture, and that's a reasonable view. But we see that David stayed faithful to God, and even when he was wrong, David used this time for, uh, God used this time for his purpose. Now, when the Philistines do march on Israel in force, some of the Philistine kings don't trust David enough to allow him to come along. Once again, we see God's hand in this. David might have been racking his brains for a way to get out of this when he was initially asked to come along on an invasion of Israel. There's no way he can get away with just pretending to attack his own people while the entire Philistine army is there watching him. But now the opportunity to get out of it just drops in his lap. They just tell him, you can't come with us. So he pretends to be indignant that they won't let him come along. And then he takes his men, takes his men home to the town of Ziklag, where their families were staying. This is a town near the southern border of Judah, and this leads to the last major incident in David's life before Saul dies. It's an incident that shows God had matured him into a strong and wise leader. David and his men, oh, are we right? Yes, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day, and now the Amalekites had raided the, the, the Zegab and the Ziklag. They attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone in it, both the young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. So when David and his men get home, they find all their wives, their children, and their elderly parents had been carried off as slaves. David's men are so angry, they considered killing him. If there ever was a situation where the temptation to simply react without thinking existed, this was it. But David pauses to take a breath and say a prayer. Then David said to, Ab to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the, uh, the ephod. Ab uh, Abiathar brought it to him. The, the, uh, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party while I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered, and you will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So earlier in his life, David had occasionally acted on impulse and without wisdom. Now he knows better. He relearned what he knew as a teenager when he fought Goliath, that he can't accomplish anything without God, but he can accomplish anything with God. So he and his men, 600 guys, they take off after the Amalekites. It's a long, hard run, and a third of the men fall out from exhaustion, and they're left behind with the supplies. But they find an Egyptian slave the Amalekites had abandoned, and by treating him with mercy, they get his services as a guide. 
And he led David down, and there they were, scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until evening the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. So David's special forces unit pulls off one more incredible victory, rescuing all of their loved ones. And David shows one more bit of wisdom afterwards. The 200 men he had left behind rejoined them. But some of the troublemakers in the units immediately start demanding that the 200 be, not, be denied any, in any share of the plunder from the battle. But David immediately puts his foot down and makes sure, makes sure that everything is handled fairly. David replied, no, my brothers, you do not do that with, uh, with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is the same as that, uh, that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statue and ordinance for Israel from that day to this. So we see firm and fair leadership with his authority respected by all. It's as if he's ready to finally be king. And it actually was time for him to become king. Remember that the Philistines were attacking Israel. In a battle at ba Mount Gilboa, three of Saul's sons, including tragically Jonathan, are killed. Saul is badly wounded, and he kills himself rather than allow himself to be captured or killed by the Philistines. So his sins led to a painful, <coughs> undignified death, and most tragically, the death of, of Jonathan, uh, D David's best friend. So David is ready to take the throne. He's not perfect. He's definitely not perfect. In fact, when he messes up, he's really going to mess up. His multiple wives and his failure to be a good father is a persistent sin that lasts through his whole life. And the consequences of that are going to affect his ability to be a good father, uh, and that will also bring a lot of pain and suffering. But it is perhaps one of the most encouraging things we find in the Bible to know that his repentance after he sinned, combined with God's capacity for mercy, means that God can still use David to accomplish amazing things. So to summarize, remember that David is also is a very important link in the chain that would one day bring us our Messiah. Remember also that God may put us through trials, but those trials serve a purpose. We can see that everything that happened to David had a purpose. We might not know what that purpose is right away. We might not know what that purpose is during this lifetime, but God has a plan for you, and he will prepare you to fulfill that plan. God is always in charge, no matter how chaotic your life it may be at times. God is there for you, and he has a plan for you. This is Jeremiah 29, one more time. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So learn to trust in God in all things. That's what David had to learn during all this time. Trust him in big things and little things. Nothing is either too big or too little for him. Trust in him rather than yourself and you'll slay whatever Goliath the God brings in front of you. Look to God with all your heart, and God will be there for you. God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for you. No matter what your life seems like from your point of view, God has a purpose for you. When David was hiding in the desert from Saul, he wrote Psalm 63, which I think is the perfect way to end the lesson tonight. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry, parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and behold your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. And that's it. Do we have any questions or comments from anyone? Yes. Um, the people living today where these battles were fought, who is it that, you know, what lands is it? Um, um, well, oh, I wish I could easily go back to the land, the thing, but a lot of it's Israel today. Uh, they, they, they go right to the Mediterranean coast, coast now where the Philistine cities would have been. Moab is probably, uh, I'd have to look at a map, I think maybe where Jordan is now. So. Now, those particular ethnic groups have long since ceased to exist. Now, God <laughs> preserved Israel because they're his people. One of the best proofs that God exists is that Israel still exists as a definable pre people group when all the rest are gone. So, any other questions or comments? Yes. 
Nope, I'm not brilliant a teacher that I explained everything that well. Okay. That's right. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well. A little faster next time. I could get this done in four. First time I did it, first time I did it was one hour and 13 minutes when I practiced it. I can go fast. Oh. Um, well, I, I assume you all, no matter how much you might enjoy the teaching, didn't want to be here till one in the morning. So, okay. Okay. So let's 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 pray. Uh, well, Lord, just thank you. Thank you that we do know you have a purpose for each of us. Thank you that you know each of us intimately, that you love each of us intimately, that you do have purpose for us. us. And I pray that we all come to trust you, to know that whatever happens in our life is part of, our, of your plan, and those plans are always for our good. So be with us in all things. Keep us faithful to you. Give us the strength and wisdom that can only come from you to live lives that are pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome.